So, of course, like we can't start any fluid mech discussion without asking what's a fluid. So, so uh, what I will say is that if people have done like, you know, two or more courses of fluid mech, try, not, try to give the others a chance to answer simple questions. But if nobody is answering, then chime in. So, yeah, um, what is a fluid according to anybody? Any force, maybe? If you push it, it'll move. If it has a place to go, it, it's going to move. Like, it's not like a solid which can resist some shear stress. Anything else about a fluid? Okay, like, what all do you count as not fluids? Among gases, liquids, solids? You think it's a fluid. Yeah, it's a fluid, but it's a very complex fluid, right? It does weird things. Yeah, so there's a whole lot of things which can fall under the general category of fluids and things which also behave between fluids and solids. So, yeah. And uh, uh, is glass a fluid? Hmm? Depend on the time scale. Okay, so uh, yesterday I was reading about is glass a fluid and apparently there's a controversy about it. So like th the basic moral is that people don't agree any longer that it's a fluid on any time scale because in those days they used to see these uh, church windows, right? Which where they thought the glass had flown down, but it turns out it's not due to flow. Like there are many church glasses which are even older. So if you do a small calculation on how long will it take to flow, it will take more than the age of the universe. So that thickness didn't come from uh, just the thing being a fluid. So like, uh, yeah, you can read about it. But so uh, my only point is that there are many things which are nebulous, like between a fluid and a solid. Okay, so we can uh, classify one thing saying that... Uh, the molecules in a fluid are free to move around. Propulsion. 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 So we'll put like flight, etc. Huh? Flight, etc. Propulsion. Sloshing. Huh? Sloshing. Sloshing where? Why is sloshing a question? Propellant? In propellant tanks, in like, let's say space vehicles, right? Yeah. So, sloshing. What else? That's all? Turbulence in the oceans. Yeah, for this climate, I should have given more plays like this. Oceans, so much more happening in, and even like, let's say rock formation. When lava flows out and forms into rocks, that's also fluid mech. You see beautiful instability patterns in basalt rocks, things like that. Yeah, uh, uh, when it's when it's uh, in it's it's like a, it is a fluid, but it may not be a Newtonian fluid. Come here, one two, and go there. Cooling systems that all goes under industrial. And it's interesting that all these variety of things you can learn a few techniques and make it applicable to all of them, right? What more? Is this hydraulic awesome? machines? Huh? Hydraulic machines. What is a hydraulic machine? Bridges. Bridges? Why do you need fluid make for bridges? You do, or, but why are you saying it? Or in hydraulic vehicles. Okay, so like many uh, any civil engineering thing you're going to need fluid make bridges. Any hydraulics? Is that all? Suspension. Suspensions? Why do you need to study suspensions? 
process industries they are quite common suspensions can also be important in the climate when you have plankton which are slowly sedimenting automobile so, design automobile design yes so in industry we have also cars aeroplanes whatever what else studying some instabilities refrigeration instabilities but in what context all of these have instabilities refrigeration nobody read about power. still now power generation i don't know why it's needed in power generation like new uh, blast processing is needed for nuclear fusion you know what like if you're online can you just text uh, put it in the text box and rajesh will read it out there's too much echo here just put it in the text box okay so uh, now nobody mentioned sports this is my worry so like yeah do you need fluid mechanics sports huh which one cycling yeah bilkul there's so much funda no in cycling so what's the funda like many of them deliberately lose right the teammates lose to reduce drag for the leader or something like that yeah cycling swimming f1 what else cricket yeah cricket tennis rafting paragliding ha huh. any sport right yeah so so many sports you need like and it's all like big money business like designing a swimsuit for a, a olympic swimmer that's like that's done in like nasa wind tunnel so you hire nasa's wind tunnel to do it like it's really big money stuff let me see if i wrote anything which you all didn't mention so yeah in uh, okay so in modern times we have to talk about disease spread right so like uh, disease spread like that has like everything to do with fluid dynamics and when you look at small creatures like viruses bacteria their dynamics is like a fluid mechanical problem it's fluid mech plus activity of those things but hydrodynamics is an important part and then there is uh, you know mm, windmills all green energy things you want to build uh, ventilated rooms which you don't want to air condition much so in order to understand ventilation in order to understand um things like that in small scale who can tell me what a lab on a chip is lab on a chip doesn't matter if you've done fluid mech tell excellent excellent so basically like a lab on a chip is also the name of a journal right yeah <laughs> so uh, so basically it's exactly what he said like rather than take a large amount of blood from you and take two days to decide whether you have a disease or not it's just like you know uh, chips were made smaller and smaller and smaller for it purposes you make a lab smaller and smaller and smaller so like micro flows become very important in this context in order to understand fluid mech okay so let's this gives us some examples but that may not be complete of course it's not complete but uh, that's where it is there's also something interesting in what fluid mech does to other fields so can you name other fields which are affected by what we do i'm not counting climate astro all these things which are directly you know dependent on the answers we find but wouldn't you say something about the computer industry like the race to make quantum machines or the race to make faster machines has always been motivated by climate or other fluid mech problems which you otherwise cannot solve you cannot solve on present day computers so we will come to that and samriddhi will be covering that in some detail but um, we need um, all these uh, Uh, we need uh, computers to solve fluid mech problems and that drives 
people who design faster computers. And uh, there's a lot of maths which has come from fluid mech. So some examples are singular perturbation theory. We'll be touching on this very briefly in the coming classes. So singular perturbation theory is one. Then uh, uh, chaos theory, like a lot of uh, this thing of trying to understand um, chaos came from fluid mechanics, came from trying to predict the weather, things like that. So uh, these are the things. And uh, in when I say fluid mech, I'm going to include like heat transfer, mass transfer, all transport things in fluid mech because th these things go hand in hand and also phase change, like something is evaporating, something is condensing, solidifying. All of those like count for me as part of fluid mechanics. So um, how many of you heard about the, okay, like all the guys who've done fluid mech would have heard, so that isn't what I'm asking. How many of you didn't know fluid make or haven't done fluid make can tell me about the continuum hypothesis? We're going to be studying fluids under the continuum hypothesis. Anyone wants to tell what that is? So we uh, discussed as uh, fluids as being made up of molecules, right? And we said these molecules are free to move and that's a fluid for us. So like, uh, let's start by looking at that. So we're going to use hy hypothesis. Somebody catch me on my mistakes, please. I make lots. So like, uh, let's think of a gas. In a gas, the molecules are like this very far away, their mean free path is very big and they're going to, they're always running around in various, with various speeds. What's the distribution of their speeds? Boltzmann. Boltzmann distribution. So they have like a whole range of velocities and depending on their temperature, they are running around with some mean uh, speed. So they're all running around and this is how a gas is. In a liquid, it's much more crowded, right? The molecules need not be bigger. But still like this molecule can move. They're subject to other forces, van der Waals, maybe hydrogen bond, some other forces which attract or repel them from each other. And then uh, they also uh, move around. They also move around with a Boltzmann distribution practically, and they also have a temperature. So that is how uh, these guys move around. And then, um, um, then the question is like, how do we write down equations for these things? Like, obviously if I want to solve for each molecule, I'm pretty much lost, right? Like I've got, you know, in this much of water, I've got six into 10 to the power 23 molecules. So I'm finished. So that's not, how we can go about it. So we do this thing called the continuum hypothesis, where we say that uh, these are all making random motions. But when I look at a, like Avogadro number of them, when I look at a very large number, I haven't yet said Avogadro, I look at a very large number of them together, like many of these things average out to zero. And we can see like, what is the behavior displayed by this big blob as a whole, which contains very, very large number of molecules. So we're going to write equations for blobs, where we're going to forget for the most part by the micros of the microscopics, but we'll discuss the microscopics a little. So we go, to us, it just is a blob, which is doing something on an average. So it's nice to keep in mind that, uh, you know, like uh, these, um, Molecules individually may be running around at the speed of sound, but we are saying this uh, flow uh, is going at like 0.1 millimeter per second. So we are looking at that averaging, which is very nice that, you know, even if you have very high individual speeds, they average out so nicely when you take an average of a large number. Is this coming out clear? Anyone has a question so far? Okay. So this is basically the continuum hypothesis. So how far down can we go? Any guesses before we say continuum is valid? 
can i uh, do fluid mckin angstrom scale no right why not that there i can't pretend that i'm averaging across a large number so what do you think is a reasonable small scale i should go to for continuum what larger than the mean free path how much is the mean free path and why should it be larger than the mean free path aren't you happy if i just average over a large number of molecules yes yes that's a good way to think about it so how much do you think it should be i mean people didn't know this answer and they still like you know different situations were different um you know you can go uh, you can use continuum to different small sizes but we can broadly think of 100 nanometer as a scale beyond which we do fluid mix so when you hear about nano flows either they taken into account that it's not a continuum or they've taken a continuum but they talking 100 nanometers and calling it nano 100 nanometers is closer to a micron than to nanometers but very often like these scales are called nano flows they given the title of nano flows so in 100 nanometer in a gas how many molecules are there 100 nanometer cube 2 minutes you can work it out I mean, am I making a reasonable assumption? In hundred nanometer cube. Ah. Oh, uh. One centimeter. Okay. So now, yeah, can you tell me in hundred nanometer cube? It's easy for you to do it now. Minus seven. Anyone has come up with an answer? Order of magnitude is enough. Ten to the four. Ten to the four. Ten to the five. Yeah. So, you, I mean, like, if it's water, it will be around thirty thousand water vapor, or some gas molecules will be thirty thousand per hundred nanometer cube. So. it's almost exactly 30000 okay so something like that will be the answer for uh, gas and in a liquid it's actually a much much better uh, approximation you can try it for a liquid like a very very small amount i mean 22.4 liters is for one mole right in in a gaseous state but uh, uh, like one mole is just 18 gram of water and 18 gram will be like a very small part of this bottle so you will be having many many more molecules so you can uh, think of that and maybe for liquids we can even go smaller till 10 nanometers and say it's a continuum so when you say it's a continuum it depends on what you're looking at and boundary conditions can pose a problem for continuum approximation so we're not going to talk about that but you can read about it if you really want to okay so i wanted to talk a bit about diffusion before we go ahead i think that uh, yeah let me do the diffusion before we go ahead since we are talking about molecules so um you know we we are going to write down terms later today or in the next class about diffusivity and i just want to give an idea of what that is from the molecular scale and after this we will not touch anything about the molecular scale we'll only live in continuum so diffusivity so the first thing we'll talk about is mass diffusivity
okay so in mass diffusivity so here is a whole bunch of green molecules they are just all over the place it will take too long to draw and then there are these yellow molecules like you can think like i put a yellow ink drop inside some other fluid so there are these yellow molecules so you we know that all molecules are always in random motion right so just by them being in random motion what's going to happen hmm they will collide they will move into each other space so even though i started with a pure yellow blob here the yellows are going to like some of them will escape and slowly they will start moving outwards and similarly the greens will escape and start coming into this so this kind of mixing will happen uh, will it happen ever that there is demixing you'll come back to a yellow blob and all green hmm that's true it will come back after a very long time but can you explain why why will it even come back right so this one is equally probable except there is one out of like some number which we don't even have a name for so yeah at some point it will come back so this is mass diffusivity now what happens if and this is a very very slow process that's what i want you to remember so what happens if these yellows are way bigger and let's say it's a liquid so the greens are crowding it will they still diffuse yes they will but they will diffuse slower right like in order for this guy to move in there like it has to clear out some of the greens and make sure there's space for it to move so it's going to dash it will it's going to undergo more collisions and it's going to diffuse less so diffusivity is in general bigger uh, slower for small larger molecules diffusivity is slower for larger molecules so like if you can think of salt and sugar so there are these diffusivity values so for salt which is a bigger molecule sugar right sugar solution so i've already melted the sugar otherwise it's more confusing uh so salt is around 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 9 meter square per second that's its diffusivity sugar is like several factors it, uh, it's actually 10 to the minus 10 i think i can safely write it down as that yeah why will the yellow particles come back because they're going through random motion so like at some place or other they're going to be kicked backwards there's no reason why they can't be kicked backwards why they should keep going outwards so if they hit against somebody while going there they'll come back so they'll be going backwards and forwards all the time and it's just very very unlikely that all the yellows will come back at the same time to that place so if you think of random walks you will understand diffusion so it's a good idea to read something about random walks sure so when we buy mango we yeah. try to just smell out of it yeah like uh, to uh, get the some idea about whether it's uh, like a sweeter or not yes so the sweet particles must be coming out but yeah it's the diffusivity is very small so how would we are guessing it like? so our nose i think is super sensitive we can sense like when there's a few molecule i mean very very small concentration so yeah you'll have to read about this and tell me like what is the concentration at which we can smell i mean we're not as good as dogs or some insects or something but we're actually not bad ha huh. so yeah like very few molecules would have diffused out but we already smell it but that's a good point like you know through the mango skin like how much concentration is coming out you can check that okay so this is as far as mass diffusivity goes any questions on this anything more you want to talk about there is uh, you know two more diffusivities we want to talk about 
So this was mass diffusivity. Where's my white chalk? Um, the next easy one to talk about is momentum diffusivity, which is the same as kinematic viscosity. Okay. So momentum diffusivity goes as the viscosity divided by the density of the fluid that we're talking about. And this we call as the kinematic viscosity. It's also in length square per time. Okay, so now like how does this get transferred from one place to another? Is this easier or harder than mass diffusivity? Any thoughts? Easier, why? Yeah, the particle need not travel all the way. So the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, I've given this thing in water, okay, I should have said in water. Here I want to make an important point, which is coming from this photo. Suppose you have gases, the mean free paths are so long that mass diffusivity, momentum diffusivity, thermal conductivity, they're all the same, same order of magnitude, maybe some factor difference here and there. But you know, that's because everything is done by molecules moving from one place to the other. This is to be remembered. Whereas in a liquid, they're not going to be mo moving so easily and so far. But momentum can be easily transferred because they're in a very crowded environment. It's like in a big crowd, I can give a dhaka and push lots of people, right? It's as simple as that, whereas gas cannot do that. So then uh, momentum diffusivity is what order of magnitude? Any guesses? These are some numbers to be kept in your head all the time. That's why I'm giving them. Momentum diffusivity is 10 to the minus 5 meter square per second in air. And all the diffusivities are the same order in gases. Remember that. And uh, this is 10 to the power minus 6 meter square per second in water. Sorry? To density. Okay, okay. So this is just, yeah, rho is density and mu is viscosity. So this is like uh, the kinematic viscosity of the fluid. So basically it comes from it actually comes from the fact that we are writing the equations in terms of velocities, not in terms of masses. So when we write it in terms of velocities, the density naturally comes to the denominator. Yeah, assuming if the fluid is more dense than the are higher, the momentum Yeah, that's true. But but given that, like it's the viscosity which dominates in the thing. So basically, it's because of the way we're writing the equations that density is coming in the denominator. So in other words, like, uh, let me put it this way. Um, if water became twice as dense, then you it would become much more viscous. So you wouldn't just get, uh, you know, a decrease in diffusivity because it became more dense. So it would, it would stay consistent. Is there any way we can estimate these numbers by some order of magnitude estimate for momentum? So like uh, from the Boltzmann, the, the kinetic theory of gases and general molecular theory of liquids, you can come up with given a temperature, all these coefficients in reasonable uh, estimation, like, you know, three by two root KT kind of things. You can easily come up with things like that. And for liquids, it's more complicated. We're not going to do that. But yeah, this is just, you know, as a fluid mechanician, like what do you need to know? So. We're going from that end. But yeah, it, to some extent, you can come up with orders of magnitude. So you know that a sugar molecule is so much more complicated than a salt molecule. So you can ask about how it will diffuse, things like that. And these magnitudes are at standard temperature. Hey, these are orders of magnitude. I could be wrong by a factor of five or something. So don't ask me which pressure and this and all like you know in in water for example you'll get like a viscosity change of a factor of two or three like within uh, some distance in the ocean you know don't even have to go very deep and maybe very deep in the ocean the viscosity will be way way bigger 
So these are all for water I've written, okay? So even in water, like if you change the temperature, the answer will change. If you change the uh, uh, pressure, the answer will change. So just, uh, in fact, the pressure, um, viscosity as a function of pressure is kind of non-monotonic for water. Don't ask me why, because I don't know. Yeah, so uh, like these are just very crude orders of magnitude I'm giving you. Uh, Rama, uh, Kevin yes. in the chat says he didn't understand what is kinematic viscosity. What is kinematic viscosity? So like uh, take the viscosity of a fluid and take the density of a fluid and divide one by the other. That's how you define kinematic viscosity. Is that good? Is that what the person was asking? Has the video stopped shaking around? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So all I said was that suppose it's a very crowded environment of the smaller ones, then it's difficult for the bigger one to find a path to move. Huh? Bigger in radius. It, it's harder for it to move forward. So imagine that, uh, imagine that uh, you know, these are all very, very close to each other. Then it will go through a lot of collisions before it can escape and make a path. Whereas suppose the yellow one was this tiny. The yellow one can be running around, right? So it's easy for the small guy to, you know, mix into a big guy. But it's harder for a, I mean, depends on the crowding again. But usually big guys, like even if they're densely packed, there'll be holes enough for small things to somehow escape. So that's basically all I was saying. Okay, so uh, the Rama, thing that's kind of hardest. Uh, there's a question. Is viscosity and density always monotonic? If not, why? Okay, so that's what I told them not to ask me. <laughs> because I don't know, like uh, uh, viscosity, uh, viscosity and density are usually monotonic functions of temperature. Like in liquids, viscosity always goes down with temperature. Because like you've seen, if I want to rub some oil on me, if I do this with my hands and then start rubbing, it moves, it spreads easier. Whereas if it's colder, it spreads more dif with greater difficulty. Whereas for gases, it's the opposite. As you increase uh, temperature, the viscosity increases because these molecules run around a lot more and dash around a lot more. So the viscosity of gases increases with temperature, the viscosity of uh, liquids decreases with temperature, and this is fairly monotonic. Uh, pressure, it's not monotonic for liquids. I just know the answer. I don't know why. And uh, what are they? They asked, is it always monotonic? And density. And density, yeah. Density also, like there's expansion due to temperature, so it's monotonic in the temperature. And most gases in most situations that we are going to consider are going to be ideal gas law type. So like we know how pressure and temperature vary. Okay, um, yeah, the hardest one is thermal diffusivity, like thermal conductivity. So how do I think about it? I'll tell you, like it may not be a very precise way of putting it, but this is how I think about it. So like uh, all the molecules in a still air will be going with some, so this is the probability of V and this is V the velocity, right, in some component. So let's say they're following a Boltzmann distribution. So there's, you know, equal number who are going in the reverse direction as in the forward direction, and the mean is zero, mean is zero. So now, like, I'm giving a dhaka. Like, I've got momentum, I'm giving momentum to the neighbor. In fact, like, I'm running in this direction, and I'm dragging the one to run in my direction. That's what viscosity does. It, uh, it uh, passes on uh, transverse velocity to all the molecules there. So these molecules are getting uh, uh, momentum from me. Uh, so that means like now I told you that this big Avogadro number of molecules is actually moving forward with a small velocity. Like it may be one meter per second or two meter per second, which is big for us. But compared to, you know, some of these velocities, Velocity of sound, these are very small velocities. So what's happening is like when I've given the dhaka, dhaka means push. I've shifted the mean by a minuscule amount. This is minuscule, I just drew it big to make it visible. 
Okay, so this is what I've done. I'm pushing the mean in that neighborhood. I'm giving some non-zero mean. So that is momentum diffusivity. For thermal diffusivity, what should I do? How should I push this distribution? Like suppose there's a warm patch here. So this is now not a molecule patch, but it's a hot patch. Okay, it's blue color, so it's a cold patch. So there's a cold patch here. So this cold patch has to diffuse out. What will it do to the distribution? Hmm? It will spread out or spread in right now. It's cooling, remember. So it has to make the distribution different. So is that easier or harder than moving the mean? Who said harder? Who said easier? They can come in, but like, are you changing their velocities? Are you changing the kinetic energy in them? And who said harder and why? I heard harder. So everybody is now voting for easier, I think. Huh? Okay, so like by changing this mean, did I change the temperature? Yes or no? Yes, I did. How much? So with temperature, has, has momentum and temperature diffused at the same time? Let's work out how, I, how much I change the temperature. Temperature is proportional to what? Speed square? Ah, but half mv square equal to kBT was this green line, agreed. But now I moved it to the yellow line. I gave dhakka, right? Now I'm asking, like, did temperature increase or what? It did. By how much? So, like, it now goes as V square. So, I changed everybody. I moved everybody by epsilon. So, instead of V, everybody is now V plus epsilon. So, now I'll get, like, average of V plus epsilon ka whole square, which is average of V square plus average of 2V epsilon plus average of epsilon square. What is this value? Zero, right? Because V is zero on an average. So we just changed it by a very tiny amount, epsilon square. Epsilon is 10 to the minus 10, not 10 to the minus big number. So then we didn't change the temperature appreciably by just change. We did change it a little bit. To change the temperature, I have to, like he said, I have to either make the distribution itself narrower to make it cooler and broader to make it hotter, right? So I have to change the random motion of a large number of molecules. And that's going to be harder. But, so it's harder than this, but it's easier than this. It's easier than that because, uh, again, molecules don't have to move all the way. Like if I'm moving very fast and I collide against someone, I can give a higher speed to someone. So I can, and, and the higher speed guys can just, preferentially move into the lower speed guys. So it's a lot easier than like a big sugar molecule walking into the other place, walking into a non-sugary place. Incidentally, like homework one for you all. These are not homeworks that will be corrected, but if you do it, it will be nice. Homework one, here's a cup of tea. And I put a bit of sugar solution at the bottom magically without shaking it. And uh, I'm not allowed to shake it. So only this uh, mass diffusivity is allowed. Now I've told you the number also. Tell me when it will be sweet for me to drink, how long I should wait. So that's your homework one. Do that little calculation at home. What? I mean, I mean, you're right, like by the time it gets sweet, it may be cold. But let's say I'm prepared to drink cold tea. Huh. Yeah, you could if you want to do a fancy calculation, you could say that the diffusivity depends on the temperature. So I'm going to take that into consideration and then I'll find out when I can drink it. You can do that as well. Or you can say, okay, like I'm neglecting that part and I'm just 
estimating when I can drink. So these are the calculations you can do and come back. So thermal diffusivity, again for gases, it's all similar, like thermal, ye, ye, all are similar. Thermal conductivity, let's call it. And this one we'll call as the word D, and this one we'll call as the word kappa. So kappa is around uh, 10 to the minus 7 meters square per second in water. So this diffusivity lies between the other two diffusivities. So, yeah. Water, what? Cup that cup is chai. You can take it as water. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so, um, so the point that I'm driving at here is the following. We have like two, at least two classes of things which are very, very different from each other. Gas, which doesn't care, is it mass, momentum, thermal, it does everything the same way. Liquid, which, you know, has orders of magnitude difference in the way it diffuses things. Gas, where if you increase the temperature, viscosity goes up. Liquid, where you increase the temperature, viscosity goes down. So all these behaviors are so entirely different. But we can actually write one class of equations, which works for all of them. And we can actually move from one to the other, which is my next point. That's why I brought in diffusivity, though I'd plan to take it later. So I brought it in now. Uh, and we're going to see how we can use this thing, this universality of liquids, gases, all fluids, which are Newtonian. Right now, this course is about Newtonian fluids, which means viscosity is allowed to depend on temperature or such things. But it's not a complicated function of shear or some other thing. So this is basically, I mean, this is all to drive home that point of universality. And also this point about diffusivity. In the ocean, it's very, very important that things diffuse differently. So lots of instabilities happen because things diffuse differently. So I didn't plan to speak on this. So I hope I don't mess it up when I tell you about it, but let me give it a try. So you have salty and warm water above cold and fresh water. Okay, suppose in the ocean you have this, then what happens? Like, is it and, and in general, anything that's lighter above and heavier below is stable, right? Anything that's heavier above and lighter below is unstable, like it will topple. Just by intuition, you can tell that. So like, is this stable or unstable? How do you know? Cold water is dense, perfect. So the cold water is, cold water is denser than warm water. But salt is dense, salt water is denser than fresh water. And this is a nice system because this happens a lot in our oceans. Like what happens is when there's evaporation, so the sunlight hits only the first few meters and they get warm. And then there's a lot of evaporation, so they get saltier. So now we have like salty and warm water living above cold and fresh water. Okay, so now suppose I, it's, let's say I've set it up so that it's stable. Let's agree. I mean, I could do either, like I, depending on whether I give more salt or more temperature, I can make it stable or unstable. But let's say I made it stable, so nothing should happen. Now, let's say I take a blob of warm and salt water here and put it here. I've taken a blob and displaced it here. Will it go back or will it go further down? Hmm? Further down, why? Okay, so let's say this. Initially, we kept this as lighter than this. Now I took a lighter guy and I brought it inside the heavier place. 
it should try to go up because it's lighter. But then what will happen is that it will, which will it lose first, its salt or its heat? It will lose its heat. So like it will lose the warm, it will become cold. Now it's cold and salty. So it will go further down. And then it reaches here. So it will become even colder if the temperature is going, you know, in that direction. So this is a kind of thing where, you know, a lot of mixing happens in the ocean when you think it's stably stratified. Just because of, and this is called double diffusive convection. This is just one thing to tell you that things diffuse very differently and that can be very, very important on the large scale. So that's the idea there. So it's almost three o'clock. Shall we break for five minutes exactly? Anybody wants to bring tea to this room, they're welcome. You can go downstairs, get tea and come back. And anybody wants to have a question or something, you're welcome to stay back. But it'll be better if you come back after five minutes and ask the question. Similarity. Okay. Is, is the kind of expansion important for different kind of diffusivity? like adiabatic expansion, isobaric expansion of a fluid? And is there any thermodynamic point of view for which kind of diffusivity will take place? Okay, so uh, the question is about expansion and large changes in volume. We, uh, this course is all about incompressible fluid where there's negligible change in density. Whenever you have very large, uh, fast expansion, like something bursting out of, high pressure zone and coming into low pressure zone. Those are all not part of this conversation. So that uh, that will have to be dealt with in a different course with some other um, aims. Dynamical similarity. Is there anyone in this room who's not heard about Reynolds number? If there's even one. Okay, so everybody knows Reynolds number. You've just heard the word, but you don't know what it is. How many of you heard it, but don't know what it is? You don't remember, great. Yes, okay. So we'll come to what it is, but I just want to say, and in this thing about dynamical similarity, this is what we're going to talk about. So Reynolds number is a non-dimensional number. It's the ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. But what exactly it is, we will see very soon. Uh, in fluid mic, one day I counted, there's at least 37 non-dimensional numbers that I have used. At least 37, and Reynolds is just one of them. And then there are hundreds of non-dimensional numbers, and typically they go by some scientist's name, whether or not it's deserved, they go by some scientist's name. So, yeah, like all of them have a... Mm, proper name, proper noun attached to them, and they're all like a whole class of numbers. All these numbers are dimensionless. So, the, so they're either like time scale of something divided by time scale of something else, ratios of length scales, ratios of, you know, uh, forces, anything you may have, even temperatures, there are lots and lots of ratios. So uh, non-dimensional numbers are a big thing in fluid mechanics. So is it just a passing fancy? Like, is it just that we like doing this? Finally, we suppose we write a force equation. The Navier-Stokes equation, which we will write down maybe tomorrow, I mean, on Thursday, is going to be, uh, is basically a force balance. So it's like mass into acceleration, maybe per unit volume, whatever on both sides. So here is an equation which is dimensional on both sides. And I non-dimensionalize it. The first thing a fluid mechanician does is like divide left hand side and right hand side by some dimensional numbers so that I non dimensionalize it. So like, is this just a passing fancy or does it have a meaning? So the moral is it has a meaning and we should try to see what that is. So that's what we are going to talk about now in uh, dynamical similarity. So, um, so let us take a specific problem. Like I'm asked to design a new kind of aircraft. So there are some aircraft already flying and I'm asked to design a new kind of aircraft. I'm given reasonably unlimited money 
and like some space, not like huge amounts of space and everything else I need to design it. So then like I can run some experiments and uh, design this aircraft. So that's the game we are going to play right now. So here is my aircraft. Can somebody do a better job of this? And it's not too bad, right? These are the windows. So here is my aircraft. And um, I want to design one which will fly. It's a very, very big aircraft. Let's say Airbus A380, that kind of big aircraft. And I want to change the wind shape. I want to do a variety of things. And I uh, want to check if it will fly or not. Okay, so what are the uh, variables here that could be important? Surface area of the wings, okay, wing area. Huh? Wind, velocity. wind velocity, very good. So yeah, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stick my plane to a, you know, a place. So I'm going to pin it down somewhere because I can't have it flying everywhere. So I'm going to reverse the Navier-Stokes. I'm going to live in the uh, in the um, frame of reference of the plane, and I'm going to first design it for steady flight. So like the takeoff, landing, and all is complicated right now. I'm not worrying about that. I'm going to design it for steady flight. Okay. So there is this plane going in velocity u, but because I've stuck the plane and I'm looking at minus u. So this is the thing. Anything else? Size of the airfoil. Okay, type of the airfoil. Some types. Density of the material. Density of the material used. Why will that matter? Why will that matter? I can write it down. So let's say the density of the aircraft itself, like the whole weight divided by the volume. Shape of the wing. He already said. That he already said wing area. Aerodynamic shape already said. Air. Yes. Uh, I, oh, I'm using A for both. Sorry, sorry. For aircraft, what shall we use? Plane. Row air. And then that's this already there. What else? That and all is too fancy right now. Uh. Attack angle. Attack angle is already accounted for in the shape of the wing. I'm going to fix. This is a fixed aircraft sitting in place A. So the attack angle, everything is looked after under this thing that I've drawn here. So we can call it shape or something like that. Okay, then. The pressure and all is a uh, not an independent quantity. It's a derived quantity from these things. Once I fix the plane, I fix the velocity, I fix pressure will come out. Somebody was saying one more thing. What was it? Nobody worried about the viscosity of air. We've spent half an hour talking about it. So let's call it the kinematic viscosity of air. Anything else? Anything I've left out? Okay, so like normally when we design something, it's better to think in terms of lengths of things. So let's say instead of the wing span, I'll have a typical length of the wing, I mean the cord length, and I'll have a typical span, and I'll have a typical, let's say, body length. So span, body length, and L, the cord length. So how many do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And nine velocity. And uh, are these all independent of each other? If they're independent only, we should count them. So this wing of the plane is taken care of by these length scales so that we can throw away. And uh, the shape, okay, the point is that the shape is going to make all the difference to whether I fly or not. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide on a shape, do experiments with that shape, see if I like it or not, and then change the shape a little bit. So the shape is not going to be part of our design. I mean, it's, it's, it's an important part of our design, but it's not going to be something we change during one experiment. So right now I'm going to build a plane of a certain kind, of a certain shape, I'm going to do the test on it and then see. So the idea is that, you know, I'm not able to actually build like half a million A380s and then like of different, different things and then, you know, keep them high in the atmosphere and see if they fall or not. I can't do that. So I have to do it in a wind tunnel or a water tunnel. And then I have to keep this little plane. I want it to be much smaller. And then I want to uh, design it properly. Okay. So in fact, in my water tunnel, the calculations I made was not for A320, but a smaller aircraft. So it was a smaller aircraft. So all the numbers I have in my notebook for that, we'll use that. So the shape we're going to right now remove it, but we're going to keep coming back to the shape like in order to get a better design. So how many are we left with? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, I can tell you that because I fixed the airplane, it's just a solid body that my flow is going around. So whether it's made of steel or whether it's made of plastic makes no difference to me. So it's just the flow going around. It's just an obstruction for the flow. So the density of the plane doesn't matter here. So how many are we left with? One, two, three, four, five, six. So if I have six independent variables, and how many uh, kinds of dimensional quantities do we have? We have mass, because density is made up by mass. Let's write down what these things are made up of. So rho air is kilogram per meter cube. Rho, yeah, rho air. And these are all meters. S, B, L are all in meters. U is in meter per second. We'll always use SI units. And uh, this thing, meter square per second. We have everything. Because like we've kept it fixed, we're talking about steady flight. We've kept it fixed. So like in other words, in steady flight, gravity also doesn't matter because there is the weight of the plane downwards and the lift act acting upwards. So this in this component, there's no net force. The only force is the drag. So right now, when I'm in steady flight, I'm just giving fuel to move forward. That's all. I'm just countering the air drag. So if I was a space plane, like if I could actually reach into space, I can travel for free. So like, I mean, there are designs coming up for those things also. I don't know whether I'll see them in my lifetime, but there will be aerospace planes not too far in the future. So then I don't have to pay for fuel. I'll do a different design. But so long as it's in the air, I have to worry about it. Okay. So, so like these are the things. So I have basically kg, meter, and second. I have three uh, dimensional uh, dimension wale variables, meter, kg, second. So now we make use of Buckingham's Pi theorem. So what does Buckingham's Pi theorem tell me? Hmm? Yes? Yeah, so I have like six variables and three quantities. So Buckingham's Pi theorem tells me how many non-dimensional numbers will describe the problem completely. And because I've de decided the shape, I already have my S, B, and L. I've decided what they are. So like uh, how many non-dimensional numbers will there be? If these are n variables, we have n equal to 6 in our case. And these are k dimensional numbers, k equal to 3 in our case. We have n minus k non-dimensional numbers, which will define the problem completely, which is how many? Three. So here I want to point out something. There's, this thing is very, very important to know that there are no, not three unique non-dimensional numbers. I can construct them in many different ways. 
but I know that there are three non-dimensional numbers which decide my problem. I can construct them in many ways. So we discussed about Reynolds number. Okay, so technically I could make a Reynolds number out of anything. Like this is one thing I like saying, like suppose I like the length of this table. I take the Navier-Stokes equations and you can't prevent me from dividing both sides by the length of this table. And I have every right to do so. And I will I mean, I'll ultimately come out with a Reynolds number as you will see on Thursday. But uh, it won't be very useful for me because in order to understand somebody else's definition, I have to keep converting from my Reynolds number to theirs. So there is no unique thing. And when I say there is a thing called a non-dimensional number, I could raise it to any power, it would still be non-dimensional. I could def I mean, define it in many ways, as I said, it would still be non-dimensional. So there are no unique things here. So like, but we choose something which is easiest for us. So how would you construct three non-dimensional numbers? That is equal to three. So Buckingham's pi theorem says there are three pi groups or three non-dimensional numbers which decide this problem entirely. So can you give one non-dimensional number, anyone? Pi one equal to the easiest ones. Nutsen number. What is Nutsen number? Hmm? That's the speed divided by the Speed divided by the? No, no, no. It's not like the Mach number. It's not like the Mach number. In fact, now that you're saying nuts and number, let me tell everybody what it is. So the nuts and number is like the mean free path divided by a length scale in the flow. So this, if the nuts and number is very big, so my mean free paths are very big. Like he said, if the mean free path is big, I can't think of it as a continuum or something. Then like I cannot use continuum theory. I have to do something else. But we are in the limit where lambda is tending to zero compared to L. So the nuts and numbers very, very, very small for us. It's zero. So that's not in our story. In our story are only these things. We can't bring additional things in the story. It's not like a serial where you can just invent a sister who was not shown till now. Hmm? What? Aspect ratio. aspect ratio is here, right? SBL. Yeah, you want, you're saying pi one is an aspect. Excellent. So I could call pi one equal to S by L. The span divided by the chord. Any other pi two equal to? Huh? Reynolds, how do you know? We don't know it yet. We don't know it yet. You've done fluid make. I told those who do fluid make, don't talk first. Huh? What? Mach number is like the velocity of the plane divided by the velocity of sound, but we never said velocity of sound is here. So that's why I changed my mind that it's a big aircraft. It's a small aircraft flying somewhere which has like a low Mach number. It's an incompressible flow. This whole course is about incompressibility as we'll come to. So we didn't write speed of sound there, so we can't bring it now. So yeah. So what's the second number? There's one more length scale, no? Like there's S by L and B by L. Those are the two things which we can put. And the third one, pi three. And I want to do something with all this other things that are there. So till now I've thrown away B, I've thrown away S because I've given them two non-dimensional numbers. So now we're left with one, two, three, and four. And we can actually uh, do an analysis as follows. So I can say U to the power A, rho air to the power B, nu to the power C, and what else is there? L. For L, I won't put any power because I said that any non-dimensional number raised to any power is still a non-dimensional number. So just to make my life easy, I won't put any power. And this quantity should be dimensionless. That's what we are doing. So like I can, I mean, I'm just going through this exercise, which is very easy for this, but is not so easy in many other cases. And if you can derive the non-dimensional numbers for a complicated problem, you're actually home. You're actually halfway home. So that's why it's important to know how to do it. So now this is meter A 
second minus a rho a is what kg oh i shouldn't have divided this let me take it as mu otherwise i'm going to run into trouble somebody should have warned me i'm going to run into trouble because they work together uh, kg to the power b meter to the power minus 3b and viscosity is in what units we'll come to it but it's kg per meter second correct so it's kg to the c meter to the minus c second to the minus c meter to the 1 so we can construct equations for a b and c a is how much i could uh, i could connect all the meter terms and make a an equation so i have a minus 3b minus c plus 1 is 0 and i have this easy one with b plus c is 0 for kg so b is just minus c so i can put it as plus 3c and uh, i have a c minus uh, what a what my i think i made a mistake somewhere is there a mistake somewhere let me look at my notes no no right right it's just a plus c is zero also so a is also equal to b which is equal to minus c so i can put a as minus c so i solve for c which becomes minus 1 and a and b are one so i get uh, u l rho a by mu and that is my pi 3 which is identical to my renolds which is u l and i can write it as kinematic viscosity okay so this is how i got my three pi groups and obviously i could have chosen b as the scale i'm writing the renolds with or anything else as the scale i'm writing my renolds with so this is what so now um what does this buy me so it buys me the fact that i can do an experiment first thing you notice is that if i ma match these three pi groups i can do the experiment and it will answer for all kinds of situations in the same with the same three pi groups so suppose i take a big aircraft and i just scale it down without changing anything of the ratios i just scale it down i make a scale model of the exact same thing then by definition my pi 1 and pi 2 are going to be correct my pi 1 and pi 2 are correct and for pi 3 i have to match the renolds number so what's a good way to match a renolds number for a small making it smaller so suppose i have a um you know small aircraft whose span is around 2 or 5 meters let's say 2 meters so very small aircraft and i want to make a scale model which is 2 uh, cm uh, 20 cm like something like this i want to scale it down so let us say i'm scaling it down by a factor of 10 and what do i do next like how do i match the renolds number i could increase the velocity if i use a more viscous medium i'll be in deep trouble because i'll be reducing the renolds number i want a higher renolds number i could use a less viscous fluid what is less viscous than air uh, decrease like vacuum oh. vacuum and all no i gave a hint pehle hi temperature nahi before the break i wrote down some diffusivities look at your notes water you just use water it's 10 times less viscous in terms of kinematic viscosity because it's 100 times denser than 1000 times denser than air and it's 100 times more viscous its kinematic viscosity is actually 10 times less than air air was 10 to the minus 5 this is 10 to the minus 6 so i can put it in a water tunnel so immediately like uh, i could actually use the same speed and i could reduce the length by a factor of okay let's look at it here 
let's look at this guy. So I could uh, increase the length, decrease the length by a factor of 10 and put it in a water tunnel and I'm done with the same velocity. Or I could play games with these things. So once I've done it for one Reynolds number, it's like I've done it for all velocities and lengths which are uh, inversely proportional to each other and all viscosity. So we have to remember also that this is for a small plane which is flying like pretty close to the ground. But if a plane is flying at 10 kilometers, what's the, what's the density of air there? Higher, lower? Lower. Like it's about a quarter there. So then you have to account for that in your viscosity calculations. So it can actually be the kinematic viscosity could be higher because of the temperature and the altitude, though, though no. So like, yeah, you have to account for those things, but the idea is I could do this experiment with an aircraft in a water tunnel. And so that's beautiful because although water and air have such different properties, I can just do one experiment and get the exact same answers. So this is the basic concept of dynamical similarity. And, and with this experiment, I can measure lift, measure drag, measure everything and give it very accurately for the big plane. And so like you want me to change B, L, the shape and all a little bit, I can play with a small uh, model and repeat the exercise. So um, before I go to the equations, I thought I'll use the rest of today to just give you an idea of um, why fluid mech is so interesting? What makes fluid mech so interesting? Finally, it's only a force balance. It's only this thing called the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay, it's non-linear, it's complicated, all that, but why, like, so what? Like, why should, you know, so many people in every university be studying various aspects of it? So uh, that's what I'd like to bring about. And uh, uh, the difference is that, the main thing is that these, fluid can do this funny thing called turbulence. And because it does this funny thing called turbulence only sometimes and not some other times, you don't know like uh, how to deal with it and it actually gives a lot of richness to it. So uh, flow we'll call, it could be laminar, it could be turbulent, And it could be between the two. We'll call it by a general name called transitional. It doesn't mean it's transitioning between laminar and turbulent, but it could be some third state, some other state which is neither laminar nor turbulent. In fact, it could even be in a state which is partly laminar and partly turbulent. So those kinds of states can exist. Now, about fully developed turbulence, there's a lot that's understood, like it's a very, very beautiful animal and Samriddhi will be telling you all about it. So I would really urge you to attend those classes. You'll get a very clear idea of what turbulence is. But here we'll talk about a general thing about what distinguishes lamina from turbulent, what, um, how does the flow go from one to the other, what are the different kinds of things that can happen. We'll just give a brief idea of this today and we will close for today. Maybe if we have time, we'll derive the continuity equation. So first, like just to pin our thoughts, let's take a pipe flow. And there is water flowing through a pipe. So like this happens in your home. How many of you have overhead tanks? Many of you have overhead tanks. So basically, water comes into a sump and you pump it upstairs and then by gravity, you can open your tap and use it. So you have an overhead tank and basically the water is flowing up a pipe and you pump it. So you're giving high pressure here so that it goes in that direction and goes to the tank. The point is normally we say about turbulence that it's chaotic, it's unpredictable, it's um, messy, all kinds of things we say about turbulence. So like if it is that unpredictable, then like we know that the water in my uh, uh, pipe is turbulent when I pump it up, then why is my electricity bill similar every month? Like one month it should be two rupees and one month it should be 20,000 rupees, right? Why is it so similar every month? So there's clearly something that we can predict about turbulence, maybe not everything, but there is something and this is the question, like whenever we discuss climate change, 
somebody or other in the audience will always ask me this like if climate change is unpredictable why are you bothering like what are you even studying like you can't make an accurate prediction because it's chaotic it's very very non linear so what are you trying so this uh, it's harder to answer it in the context of climate but we do know from experience that we are making certain estimates like certain directions certain things we are not wrong about like we know that if you go on putting more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere the earth's not going to get cooler on an average so this kind of prediction we can very easily make and we can make even more quantitative predictions even though everything is turbulent everything is non linear everything is interconnected so it all looks very hopeless but the point is that you have to approach it in clever ways and simplify it in the right ways so this is what is the beauty about studying turbulence like you understand some broad features of it okay yeah yes it's 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 coming from the non linearity of the equations so like uh, maybe i'll do the one hump map next time shall i do root to chaos next time would you be interested okay i'll do it on thursday so you'll see like where the unpredictability comes from basically like two points which start out with very nearby trajectories go very very far away in their future so that's where the unpredictability comes from and by its nature fundamentally in turbulence like if two points are very very close to each other at some point they're going to go very far away from each other so it's going to become unpredictable if i want to ask about that particular parcel of fluid like where it went but i can ask general things i can ask averages i can ask moments i can ask distributions those things i can get right so that's the basic idea so although it is unpredictable for a given parcel it need not be unpredictable on an average is that what you were asking okay okay so we were talking about pipe flow and uh, we know that a velocity profile if it is laminar is parabolic who doesn't know this do you, anybody want me to derive it i can do it next time we don't have time now but yeah take it today as parabolic okay we'll derive it in 5 or 10 minutes next time or next next time so this is what the laminar velocity profile looks like and i put pressure high here pressure low here so like there is a force net force in this direction and the flow is walking in that direction okay so oh, sorry but i read fluid dynamics class in class 11 sorry i had to do dynamics class in class 11 huh. so i'm just asking but the velocity is uh, lower on the ends because of the drag of the pipe yes 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 the velocity is zero at the wall because of the no slip condition huh. so what happens is now we'll go back to thinking about it as being molecules so these molecules are dashing on the wall all the time and as they dash they going to go backwards so the they they'll all come to a standstill at the wall after a few dashes so you can actually put an arrow diagram and convince yourself that after a few atomic length scales or mean free paths they will all come to a standstill so that's why it becomes parabolic as we'll see next time so we will it's no slip at the wall but uh, it's got its maximum in the center line so i have given high pressure here and low pressure there it's walking in a straight line so laminar is easy to understand i can do a force balance and i can see as we will do in the next class why it has this particular profile um what about a turbulent profile what does turbulence look like anybody knows a turbulent profile those who studied fluid mech it's flatter it's a little flatter it will be like this let me draw it in another color that's what a turbulent profile looks like when i average it out okay but the individual ones will look the individual trajectories are a royal mess so the first thing to get is that this is very counter intuitive because i put high pressure here i put low pressure there then what business does any fluid particle have to travel backwards 
So they're traveling in all kinds of directions where I did not apply a net force. So they're doing this very uh, uh, complicated kind of behavior, which is completely um, counterintuitive. Like by Newton's laws, force is mass into acceleration. So they should move in the direction of the force, as simple as that. So the reason they move backwards and forwards is that it's not just this net force. There's forces from between every blob of fluid to every other. They're all forcing each other through pressure. So this can make other solutions possible, other kinds of behaviors possible. And the Navier-Stokes equation has many, 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 many solutions. That's the point. It has even many um, periodic solutions. We'll come to that in a minute. It has highly non-unique solutions. And because it has so many solutions, which solution will be manifested? So that's the next question, right? So which of, um, typically, which solution is manifested whenever you have many solutions to a given problem? What? The mean of all of them? Minimizing some other condition. Yeah, quite right. And uh, it could even be the mean of, I mean, it, it could be sampling many of the solutions, depending on, you know, what their relative energies are. So that's also a possibility. That's also a possibility. And it also depends on the stability of the solution. So let's think of the solution itself as, let's say, the bottom of a well or bottom of a valley or top of a hill. So the solution itself is like a ball sitting here or a ball sitting here. So like if both of these are solutions, this one is going to be manifested because the other solution, the fluid will run away, the flow will run away from it. Right. So there are many things that can happen based on what will be uh, what will be manifested. So like somebody who's not done fluid mech, who's seeing these profiles for the first time, can you tell me which profile will have the bigger flow rate? Any guesses on which will have the bigger flow rate and why? and why that's important. Mm? No. Laminar will have bigger, who's voting for laminar? Everybody's voting for laminar. Turbulent, who's voting for turbulent? A few are voting for turbulent. Okay, somebody who said laminar say why and somebody who said turbulent say why? Why you thought it will have a bigger flow rate? Okay, so okay, and why did you say turbulent? Yes, it's true, but but both of them have a no slip boundary condition here. Yeah, yeah, but but that doesn't mean it's going to be on the average higher. It could be on the average anything, right? So like it depends on what the integral under that curve is when I integrate in that direction. I mean, I do 2 pi r dr of that. Huh. Right. So the point is that turbulence is very wasteful. There's a lot of dissipation of kinetic energy right there. So because it dissipates so much, like the net, you know, flow rate goes small for a given force. So you're forcing it here. And uh, so the area under this orange curve is actually less than the area under the white curve. It's because turbulence is very wasteful. So like when you give a, a certain pressure drop in a laminar flow, you lose um, you lose something at the wall. I mean, on an average, you'll dissipate mainly at the wall. Even in a turbulence, you'll um, dissipate mainly at the wall. But uh, it all depends on the gradients at the wall. So this one has a higher gradient at the wall. So on an average, it's, it's a way in which it loses its energy. But basically, it's because it's wasteful. It's because it's pushing things in a purposeless way than, rather than moving forward. So I think of it as like a class of naughty children that some teachers are taking on a picnic. So if they are those nice kids who celebrated World Environment Day last week, right? 
those all like if the teacher pushes like this they'll all walk in a laminar way like there was no problem but if the kids are naughty then the teachers have to really work hard to push them forward right they'll be running in random directions so that's kind of what turbulence does like you have to do more to make it do the same thing on an average so in another way to think about it is that uh, there is this molecular viscosity which we've been talking about in turbulence there's an effectively bigger viscosity it's called eddy viscosity so you're wasting a lot by going you know backwards and that makes it uh, harder to i mean you have to apply a bigger force so because finally if viscosity was zero you don't need any energy to push it that's what we talked about about the plane like if it is going in space there's no there's no air around and it, it doesn't have to spend on fuel whereas like because of viscosity and the no slip boundary condition you have to apply pressure so that you have to do more for turbulence and less for laminar so like in some sense when fluids are flowing fast when the reynolds number is high typically it's in turbulence so it's choosing the less intuitive thing to do it's always choosing this less intuitive thing to do whereas lamina would have been the more intuitive given the direction in which the force is being applied so that less intuitive thing makes it richer and more colorful and things like that so um let me just do this thing oh Ash, i'm not allowed to write there any questions online rajashi okay okay ask but plot shows friction factor goes down with reynolds number this suggests wall drag is low at higher reynolds number so turbulent flow rate should be higher at higher reynolds number the friction factor goes down the friction factor is multiplied by u square so that's a friction factor is a non dimensional number which is divided by u square so like just ask them to multiply it and they'll see that the actual drag goes up there are some bizarre situations where actually the friction goes down in transitional and all but that's beyond the scope of this discussion okay so uh, what were we talking about the lamina turbulent thing okay so one thing that i want you to visually think about which is very very hard to imagine but if you get this straight it really helps you think about turbulence so take this pipe flow The water will flow very fast. Mm. That means that if you uh, somehow make turbulent flow, uh, there is going to be high. No, in that case, it's not because you made it turbulent. You made it go in solid body rotation and you reduce the pressure beach may that made it very eager to go to the low pressure. So it could be like laminar. It's not because it's turbulent, but it's because you did some rotation to reduce the pressure to help it come down. Yeah, yeah, you would have just put it in solid body rotation unless you're who has the question you unless you're swirling it like enormously fast, in which case it will again go to turbulence and again there may be a reduction. But any um, any solid body rotation will give some kind of vorticity in the middle and that gives low pressure in the middle and things can come out faster. Okay, so uh, I want you to think about this like now forget these average thingies. Forget all this average picture, and you've got like this kind of flow. Um, so normally, you say that if a if a system is more than three dimensional, it can be chaotic. So like if nonlinear, it, if it's nonlinear and more than three independent variables, actually, like in a fluid, there are infinite number of variables. because technically so if i draw like a state space like in hamiltonian dynamics you'd have drawn state space and things right position versus velocities things like that so like right now for to describe this state it's infinite dimensional in other words like every place 
every single point on it has, let's say, at least a velocity. Let's forget about temperature and those things. It's a function of x, y, z and time. So even if I take a picture at one time, where I've got all the three-dimensional velocities everywhere in the pipe, that determines, and so let's say like I've made it discretized, like I made it a finite but very large number of velocities. So I can store the state of this pipe by you know, storing a very large array of velocities everywhere. And that will give me like one, um, one snapshot of this pipe. And the very next time, it can be a completely different snapshot. And with turbulence, that's what happens. With laminar, with laminar it's a lot easier because if I draw this profile, I, I just plot it as a function of y or radius. I plot it as a function of radius and it's the same thing repeated everywhere and it's circularly symmetric. So in the theta direction and z direction, it's the same and in time, it's the same. So like in laminar, I can actually describe it in terms of a few numbers, but for turbulence, it's actually a very, very large number. And this is what I want to think about, uh, want you to think about as the state space of this thing. So, but because it's 2D or 3D in our, and the blackboard is only 2D. So when I draw it, like just imagine that's how it is. Okay. And we were talking about this bottom of the valley and top of the hill kind of scenario. And I mentioned that as Reynolds becomes bigger, it tends to be more turbulent. So if this is Reynolds number, then uh, this part could be laminar. This part could be turbulent. Something like that. So like what happens is, suppose I, and why do I call it that? Suppose in this pipe, like I uh, have a certain pressure drop I've given. I'm maintaining that pressure drop and it's laminar, but I shake the pipe or I jump near the pipe and then like I leave it there. So what will happen to it? Will it continue to be laminar or will it go, go into turbulence? So huh? it will go back to laminar because laminar was bottom of a valley. So now like when you think valley, think that, that it's a valley in very, very large dimensions, not in three dimensions. It's a valley in a very, very large number of dimensions. So whatever I start with my state, like my Reynolds is very low. Whatever I start as my state with U, V, and W everywhere, it will become that. It will go down into that valley in very large dimensions. So that's what the stability of a laminar flow means. Okay, yeah, somebody asked something. Yeah. Um, sorry, but I'm not understanding this. Okay. What are the three dimensions? I don't get it. Okay, in space, we have only three dimensions that we're not bargaining. Yeah. But if I want to write the turbulence, I have a vector which has a very large number of dimensions. So the, ha, ha, yeah, it's not spatial dimension. Okay, so I have a vector, it's an array, like n dimensional array. So I wish I had a different word for it. Exactly, exactly. And now our basis is like one per grid point. However, we, uh, so I have a very, very large array or a matrix or something, which is describing my uh, uh, flow at a given time. So that is many dimensional. So I'm saying that suppose I start with this, I shake the tube, right? So I'm putting a very different velocity at each place, which could be very complicated, like with vortices and other things in it. So I'm putting that and I'm letting it go. But because this laminar thing is stable, in that infinite dimensional space, every point reaches the velocity it should for the lamina. So they're reaching this valley, which is in that infinite dimensional space of variables. You get it? The valley is not in three dimensions. The valley is not in three dimensions. Only the flow is in three dimensions. Got it? I mean, sorry, but it's confusing. Yeah, yeah, it's a very valid thing you're asking, huh? When we say that it's not in three dimensions, do we mean the basis factor that we need to assign it to understand it or again the spatial number? No, just the basis things that we need. Okay. So, so the, the value is three dimensional space, right? The space 
so so i'm saying like you can't think of it as a valley that's sitting in this space okay, okay. it's a valley in that space of vectors is a space of that big vector yes yes it's an abstract thing where at each for each value of x y and z there is a preferred velocity and you have shaken it out of that preferred velocity it will rush back into that preferred velocity so yes yes but if you give it a valley name actually i shouldn't talk of it as a valley because Okay, okay, okay. So you're thinking of what is the stable um, thing that the thing with the lowest potential that it's reaching? Yeah. So you can think of it as a lowest potential it's reaching. Although, like in fluid mech, in many stability problems, potential is a wrong word because it's vertical, and that's why I didn't use the word potential. So I just said, okay, let's call it an attracting point. Yeah. We'll call it an attracting point, like where the attracting point is actually a multidimensional vector. So, like at every point, there's an attract attracting velocity. So it attracts to that velocity. Okay. So that is what happens in this regime. So, like there is a clear attractor. So you disturb it; it goes back to the attractor. In turbulence, also there is an attractor. it looks like each one is doing manmana like jo bhi karo like anything goes it's like white noise it's not it's not there are only certain things that are allowed and those certain things are those which satisfy the navier stokes equation so there is an attractor like once you make it turbulent it will obey navier stokes and it will live in a small subspace of all the allowed velocities and things it's going to live in an allowed subspace but that allowed subspace is so very huge that at each time it can sample different different things and it has to satisfy the unsteady navier stokes so if there's any forces left unbalanced it can rectify itself so the unsteady navier stokes provides way more solutions that can be satisfied in time and space so it's an attractor but that attractor cannot be drawn as a point in 2d although i'm going to draw it as a point in 2d so like for low renolds when renolds is small this is like that multi dimensional thing that i showed you like all the velocities and all the things there is one point in laminar which is the attractor so everything goes there uh, this is at low renolds and at high renolds it will keep exploring some things of it but only certain allowed things and uh, i can put like a no, no, notional point there which is the turbulent attractor so it's all attracting to that so these are the two kinds of things that are there so there is 5 minutes left are you all tired shall we continue this next time or shall we finish this part of the story today finish this part okay great so like now what happens is that in this thing i showed you this kind of diagram where there is one particular critical renolds number below which laminar is an attractor and above which turbulence is an attractor right so this was an easy way to think about it like suddenly this thing which was a valley and that's why i'm using valley sorry i don't remember your name avantika so i'm using the word valley because like slowly as i increase renolds it's becoming shallower and shallower the attraction and then it's becoming flat and then uh, meanwhile this thing which was very very unstable is becoming like this like this and that becomes attracting so like this used to be attracting and this used to be repelling uh, below a certain renolds and as i increase the renolds this became repelling and that became attracting so that was a clear bifurcation point and this happened okay and then it went to that messy attractor and it lived there now instead of this in many many shear flows like pipe flow channel flow like you take a whole range of flows except the one on the aircraft what happens is both are attractors at the same time in a range of renolds numbers so what will happen is there'll be this renolds thing 
and we won't talk about by it is so it will you know if i keep increasing the reynolds number it will be lamina till here but actually in a range of reynolds numbers there'll be one more solution so here i've drawn something which i call amplitude and here i've drawn something which i call reynolds number what i call reynolds number is indeed the reynolds number so forget this part of the branch right now above this reynolds number it's always turbulent below this reynolds number it's always laminar okay there's a range of reynolds numbers in the middle where both of them are attractors and so like this is the turbulent branch and this is the laminar branch i drew them like this because i'm measuring the distance from the laminar flow the typical distance from the laminar flow in those u's v's and w's so if i measure like u1 minus u uh, u1 minus u laminar 1 the whole square and like that i add it up over every place that will give me a certain amplitude of distance from the laminar flow and uh, if i do that like this is the kind of thing i get so earlier i talked about a simple bifurcation here where a valley turned into a hill here we can imagine that we have two valleys in this region so we have something like this the laminar and the turbulent okay so both are attractors it depends on where i am like if i could be on this side of the hill i'll fall down here this is actually the hill this is actually the unstable manifold that i drew so like that is also a navier stokes solution but it's unstable so if i start on this side i'll fall here if i start on this side i'll fall there it's equal to same this so i have what is called a basin boundary i have this thing called a basin boundary and so now what does my uh, state space look like in this intermediate regime of reynolds number my uh, i've got a laminar attractor i've got a turbulent attractor and i've got a basin boundary like this so if i've started on this side i fall there if i started on this side i fall here okay and uh, you can think about this basin boundary as a kind of plastic sheet so like whoever starts on the laminar side is doomed to be on the lamina side they need not be nearer the attractor like this guy is nearer the turbulence than the laminar but it's on this side of the basin boundary so it will fall here and this guy is actually very very close to the laminar but it's actually part of the turbulent attractor okay so this is how it works in these intermediate reynolds numbers so depending on what your initial condition is you're going to fall into one or the other so that's the way it works and uh, so this attractor is also very very interesting attractor what happens is that uh, we call this thing an attractor and normally whenever we talk about something that's chaotic we say that it's a periodic that means it will never ever repeat itself so like that's the uh, signature of a chaotic Uh, problem but in the chaotic regime so when the reynolds number is in this regime it could be very very high also whenever it's in the chaotic regime uh, there are periodic solutions also of any equation but in particular of the navier stokes equation so like there are many many periodic solutions so like we said there's an infinity of solutions it could take on so which one will it take and so in the pipe and in the channel this is a very important thing because it has many periodic solutions which are of many, many different periods you take any period there'll be solutions of that period so like suppose i have a particular solution so in like you know when oh, i can't write there so when i see it from above when i like let's think of a channel like a plate and i'm seeing it from above so the plate is on this board i could have like very neat rolls like this and these rolls are moving up and down this could be like one kind of solution i can have like some of these rolls which then appear and disappear over time so i have many uh, situations which don't look random 
they look more ordered there's some order there and it could go up and down in time it could be a very complicated and very long time period order but there is some order so there are these solutions of the navier stokes and actually like some people do this game like for the for a living to find more and more such solutions invariant solutions of the navier stokes so they could be like a single point solution like laminar only one u at every place one given u at every place and time or it could be like something which repeats after one minute repeats after 10 minutes and that entire thing will repeat that entire whole solution will be a periodic solution there could be quasi periodic solutions so like there's a whole lot of such solutions of the navier stokes what does turbulence do you had a question there are a few questions yeah ask uh, the first one is what are the axes of the plots you drew the phase plots you drew what are the axes of the, those plots okay 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 so these are like u1 u2 like the velocities in infinite dimensions at every x so it's actually an infinite dimensional thing that i drew uh, the second question is what defines the basin boundary what defines the basin boundary it's very very complicated to decide like uh, where the basin boundary is right now we only can get basin boundaries by computations we have no there have been some experiments few experiments in lewis reynolds numbers where they've actually been able to get a basin boundary and there are things called edge states which we won't go into or we'll mention casually but yeah there are very few experiments most of the time you can get the basin boundary only by elaborate computations basically start from initial condition see where the flow goes and some stability analysis can give you some things the fact that you know it's unstable the lamina flow is an attractor that you can get by stability studies that's one way to do it yes Boundary attractor and what is it uh, feasible? In yeah, so at reasonable Reynolds numbers, people are finding it feasible. But in more and higher and higher Reynolds numbers, it's harder and harder. But effectively, if you have like many cores running in parallel, you can aim for higher Reynolds numbers. And right now, like for standard flows like pipe channel. there's a whole library of periodic solutions so if you find a periodic solution you'll add it to the library so there are people who made libraries of these solutions so we know what all are the periodic solutions of turbulence and and as you increase the renolds they become way more complicated and way different so we can't access those yet and there's many many more solutions the computing aspect i think we use the tools as such but in cfd you have tools such as ran uh, renault service analysis yes so how 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 do you go about using the analysis application based on renault number it's higher or lower okay so what the renault average navier stokes so there is this whole field called turbulence modeling where you say that look i don't care about your vortices and your each guy and you know the trajectories in state space all that like just give me the monthly average so that i can pay my electricity bill so that's basically the concept behind behind renolds average navier stokes you say that uh, there is this perturbation term we'll talk about it when we talk about the navier stokes but there's the perturbation term which you model in some way you make it a mean term you take the perturbation term and write it in uh, i mean as its mean and then you uh, basically so the easiest way to do that is to say it enhances the viscosity and give it an eddy viscosity yeah but you given an you given the convection a diffusive behavior so you give it an eddy viscosity which could be a function of space and time if you want and then put that in and you'll get the averages right so the idea is like how do i meanify this thing like i take the mean of the whole thing so obviously if in a linear system if i take the mean the perturbations will all die off and i'll get an equation for the pure mean but in a non linear system i'll get uh, disturbance times disturbance times disturbance depending on what power i have how much non linearity i have and those things won't go away on average 
So, but I give some thing for its mean behavior because I know that flow. So, only in a known flow, I can do that. And it's because I know the answer, I've constructed the answer. It's effectively like that. But I can extend that to other Reynolds or other situations, I mean, similar situations. How would you describe the, what makes the motion periodic? Because is it the time, time occurrence or the motion of the flow? Huh, so periodic means, periodic means I start with one particular velocity at every place, U, V and W at every x, y, and z, and uh, they will run according to the equation. They will run, 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 run. And after a time period, capital T, every place will return to that same velocity. Yeah. So after a time T, it's exactly the same picture. And like if I look at T plus delta T, I mean, zero plus delta T, that will repeat at T plus delta T. So every one of those photos at every time will repeat after tap T. So that is what a periodic flow is. Thanks for asking that. And uh, yeah, any other? Uh, there are a few questions about literature. Uh, okay. Any books, recommended books? Okay, okay. Let me write the recommended books. Faber, Fluid Dynamics for Physicists. Since many of you are physics, physics graduates, Written is a very lovely first book. It's like a storybook. What's it called? Introductory Fluid Make or something like that. And then there is Bachelor, which is Introduction to Fluid Make. It's a little more grown up than Triton, but uh, you can read it. Yeah, so these three books I would give, but uh, many of these things are not discussed in books. Uh, isolated things are discussed in isolated papers. You will not find lamina turbulent transition in any book very neatly described according to modern understanding. Uh, and there is a request to explain uh, thermal diffusivity again. Okay, so uh, thermal diffusivity. You guys don't mind another 15 minutes? Okay, so thermal diffusivity, let's do that again. I'll rub this part. Hey, wait, let me finish the story and then go to thermal diffusivity. Remind me about that. Let yeah. me finish this story. So, yeah, this story. Now we talked about this basin boundary and we said it's like a plastic sheet and there are these things, attractors on either side. That's not all. Those are not the only fixed points. Remember this thing that I drew? This thing was a fixed point in the Navier-Stokes, except it was an unstable one, top of a hill one. So like there is this thing from which everything will fall off. So a basin boundary has that kind of character. Okay, so it could be repelling in these directions, but there's always at least one saddle point. There's always at least one saddle point on the basin boundary. And this comes from theorems on chaos and things. So which we are not going to go into right now, just accept there's at least one saddle point and there could be saddle points everywhere. There could be saddle points everywhere. And in turbulence, there's a multitude of saddle points which come and go. Okay, so in that state space, in that infinite dimensional space, there are saddle points all over the place. Hmm? Yeah, I'm coming to that. So like what happens is that Although turbulence is completely aperiodic, this lovely thing that turbulence does is the following. It chooses one periodic solution of the Navier-Stokes. It doesn't go there because the periodic solution itself is unstable. So it will not go and crash into the periodic solution, but it will hug the periodic solution for a very long time. And it will do like almost periodic behavior for a very long time. And after a while, it reaches a saddle point and it hates that it gets repelled to another one. So like it's near it, this attractor for a long time. And then it, so there, there are things in the turbulence which kind of attract and repel it. And although like a periodic solution is unstable, it can actually stay there for a very long time and then leave it. So then like it explores all these periodic solutions and quasi-periodic solutions which people have found. So that's why when you look at a turbulent pipe, it doesn't look like a complete white noise mess. 
you'll see nice vortices, rolls, you'll see them appear and disappear, long rolls, which are, you know, across the thing, like, you know, big vortex like that, which are arranged in a nice pattern around the pipe. So you'll see all kinds of beautiful patterns. It will not be random like you think. It is unsteady and changing in time rapidly, but these beautiful things are being explored all the time. So that's what it does, turbulence. So like, in fact, they think, I mean, now the thinking is that uh, it's turbulence spends a lot of its time near one of these periodic solutions, however complicated they may be. And these saddle points, also you can think that this is an infinite dimensional space, right? So there could be many attracting directions and few repelling directions, or there could be many repelling directions and few attracting directions. And as the Reynolds number becomes higher and higher, the attracting directions become lower and the repelling directions become higher. So you are exploring more and more things because whenever you're in anything, you get repelled from there. So this is what makes shear turbulence like very, very beautiful and very different from noise. So is this general thing going home? Yeah, uh, I think I'm completed this part of the story. Rajashi, what is the other question? Thermal diffusivity again, okay. So this is velocity and this is the probability of the velocity. So like this is how it is when the fluid is static, right? Nobody is going anywhere and each molecule is doing this thing. So I said that in order to change this, so like suppose one place, one locality has temperature T1, it looks like this. Another locality has a much higher temperature T2. Higher temperature T2, I'll plot it on top of the same graph. It's going to look like this. So this is T1 and this is T2. Agreed? So you have like, you want the entire distribution to go from here to here. That's what thermal diffusivity does. Like this, 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 these orange molecules start looking more like the yellow. The yellow guys start looking more like the orange. And then finally, they all come to a kind of mean temperature. Agreed? So that's what thermal diffusivity is going to do in the long run. It's going to bring them to the mean temperature. Now, all I said was that this is harder than just transferring a piece of momentum. And it's easier than all the molecules going to another place. So it's not as if all the orange guys, you know, mixed into the yellow. They just gave their temperature to the yellows. So that's easier than them physically going to the other place. This is what I said about thermal conductivity. Anything else? The final question is, will there be any assignments to solve till Thursday? Hey, wait, wait, sorry, 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 sorry. I gave you one homework, right? These, huh? The T1. And there's one more, which is, uh, huh, which is that, uh, uh, like, the, it has two parts. What we argued for the airplane, uh, design something for an insect flapping. Like, if I want to understand insect flight. So, what will happen is the insect flaps its wings with some frequency. And typically, insects are this small, mosquitoes this small, and then it flaps at some incredibly high rate. So if I put a mosquito, a real mosquito in a wind tunnel, first of all, like you have to really convince it to fly, like, but people who are experts in that, they know how to make it fly. And then like you have to have an incredibly fast camera and an incredibly resolved thing where you can actually get the vortices and all that it's generating and actually understand its lift drag and what keeps it up. So nobody really understands insect flight too well, but they're getting better and better. So now like uh, design, let's say a water tunnel for it, where I can do it with a normal camera. This thing can sl flap slowly. But for that as well, right? So huh? why don't you go for complex imaging, like sterilizing and doing it 
Slytherin will not give you accuracy. It's not going to give you spatial accuracy or temporal accuracy. So I'm saying you can make a model mosquito. Just like we made a model aircraft. You make a model mosquito and it make it flap like that. Yeah, like from a dead mosquito, you can make a scale model. And knowing its frequency, you can make it, yeah. So design that. And another thing is like choose any problem and design an experiment using the concept of dynamical similarity. Like, so, all those pi values? Yes, yes. Do all the pi values and do it for any system like, uh, let's say, rock formation or any of the other problems we talked about in fluid mech, like lung, uh, blood flow, anything. Choose a problem and make a, you know, use dynamical similarity to design an experiment. That's your second homework. So yeah, that is about the homeworks. I had a third homework, but I'm going slower. I'm going slower, so I'll have to give this homework next time. Anything else, anybody? YouTube live stream. And please feel free to give critical comments. If you don't disagree, if you don't agree with something I'm saying, say it right here. We can, I mean, I'm not always right, so I can be contradicted happily. So you can do that. And secondly, like if there's any other feedback, like, you know, I should be going faster, slower, not covering this, not covering that, feel happy to tell me. Because we have two more lectures. I forgot to say this. We have two more lectures and the last of my lectures will be an experiment day. So we'll see like experiments which the TAs and Iqbal are working hard to create. We may or may not see perfect experiments because we're trying our best in the last minute, but we'll certainly show you some experiments with which you can do theory or you can go home and take home something nice. So that will be on the 22nd, right, Rajarshi? Yeah, yeah 22nd. We'll have that. And any questions you have, feel free to email Ritwik, Rajarshi or Pratik. This is for the basis of attraction. Yeah. References. Yeah. Uh, basin of attraction. See, any normal nonlinear dynamics book will give you, but not in terms of turbulence. For simple, simple things, it will give you. In terms of turbulence, there is an annual review paper. I think 2021. Yeah, I can give you the reference if you mail me. Yeah.